Hello and welcome back to Amazing Potentials, how to build a particle simulator in Python course. If you haven't seen episode one or lesson one, and um, you don't know much about VS Code or the Anaconda environment, I highly recommend that you check that episode out first and then come back to this uh, to follow on because we did some crucial environmental setup. But now that we've got that sort of uh, boring bit, so to speak, it's foundational, it's essential, but it is a bit tedious, isn't it? Um, now that we've got that over and done with, we can actually get on with creating our own particle simulator. And we're going to do that using a framework called Pygame, and we can look a little bit more into that later on, but that will give you some immediate feedback as to what's going wrong or what's going right with your code, and then we can um, fix it or add some new features to it as we go. But everything is going to be built upon uh, Pygame being our sort of front end, showing us what our simulator is effectively doing in the background. But without further ado, let's go straight to Anaconda Navigator. So hopefully you've got that installed. Um, let's click on that and open it up. It'll take a little while uh, showing some command prompts and things like that, but we'll just give it a moment and eventually it should show up on the screen. And there we go. So last week we set up an environment and that one I called Particle Simulation. You might have called yours something different. But the critical thing is to make sure that you click on this and that this is the environment that we're working in. You can see all of the packages that are installed, which actually, relatively speaking, is not much for a Python environment right now because we've only just set it up. If you haven't created the Python environment because you haven't seen the previous episode but you know about Anaconda and VS Code, just if you could create a new one, and do it for Python 3.9. Um, that's the version that I'm working in. And it'll just make sure that we're all on the same page. So now that you've selected Particle Simulation, let's jump back to home, and we're gonna launch VS Code. Just give that a moment. And here we go. So we've opened up VS Code. And the next thing that you need to do is to create some sort of uh, folder structure. So, if you go uh, into here, you can, uh, in fact, click File, and you can click Open Folder, for example, and you can navigate your um, whole computer here. So go to wherever you want to create a folder, and that's what we'll select. For us, we'll go into uh, here, Tutorial Code, and select Folder. So I've already set up uh, a folder structure, which is gonna be hosted on GitHub, and I'll post a link within the uh, comments on this video so that you can actually get, get access to that. But the critical thing is I don't want you to go straight to that, download the code and just run it, because I think we lose a lot by not actually kind of going through creating it together, finding out where we get sections of the code from, how they work, and so on. So I really want us to work together from scratch on this. But if you really get stuck or you know you, you want to check out a bit more, you can go to that GitHub link and, um, and clone the repository to your local machine and, and run it from there. But let's, for now, create a new file. And I'm going to call it um, Hello World. And we'll call it Hello World.py. So this is our Hello World of Particle Simulation. This is what this episode is all about, getting our particle showing on the screen and getting it moving and bouncing off the walls. That's what we're going to do. So let's hit enter. And you'll notice, hopefully, that you'll get this little message saying, do you want to install the recommended extensions for Python? I suggest that you do because without that, it's not really going to work very well. And it's a pretty simple installation. Click the button. It'll start installing Python. We'll give it a moment to get that done and dusted. But for now, the next thing that we need to do is to go and uh, get the framework in which we'll be working in, which is which is the whole Pygame uh, environment. So the first thing that we should do is, is search for Pygame because there, there are a couple of things that are not intuitive with what we need to do to set this up. So if you search for um, Pygame uh, Conda, 
uh, there are uh, a couple of ways to install it, but I highly recommend that you do it within the Conda environment because it makes sure that Conda has control over the um, installation and removal of uh, the packages that you that you want access to. If you do something like pip, which you might have seen, uh, that sometimes can cause problems. So I prefer, if possible, if the package is available within Conda, to use Conda to install it instead. So let's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna click on the Stack Overflow post because I actually had to scroll all the way to the bottom of this to find a useful little link, which was, uh, let's find it. Here we go, this. So I'm gonna type that in and then you can type it in with me. Um, but there's there's this uh, repository called Conda Forge. We're gonna use that to get access to Pygame. If we do the standard Conda install, it won't find it. So the way that we can do the installation, which I tend to prefer, is to click on environments, click on this uh, play icon, and then open terminal. It'll bring this command terminal uh, to the fore. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna paste that command in. So if you wanna have a go at typing that in just so that you can see it. And then once you've typed it in, we'll hit enter, and then it'll start installing all of the packages. Okay, so just take a pause if you need to take a little bit longer to type it in, but I'm going to hit enter now. And this hopefully will be a fairly painless installation. You can see that Pygame actually wants to install quite a few things. So you can see all of the different packages that Pygame is dependent upon. We don't really need to worry too much about what those are. The key thing is that we can hit the letter Y and hit enter and we'll proceed with the installation of the packages. You can see at my end, it's done that pretty quickly. It might be for your end that it might need to download a few of those, and that might end up making it a bit slower. I've already got these available on the computer, so it's installed it much quicker. But now that we've got Pygame installed, that really is the only additional package right now that I'm gonna say that we need. We're gonna install some other ones as we progress in the course, to make things a bit faster, um, to be able to represent things in a more helpful way. But right now, to do our Hello World exercise, that's all we need. So let's check back and see if Python's finally installed as an extension in VS Code. Yep, so everything seems to be working okay. Hopefully the same is true at your end. There's a small chance, you shouldn't, I don't think you should need to, but there's a small chance you might need to restart VS Code do make sure you give that a go if you're having any problems. So if we jump back, we've got our blank, our empty canvas, our Python file that has absolutely nothing in and that is doing nothing to help us in terms of getting us towards particle simulations. So we should actually make a move and start writing some code. But my general principle with this is rather than trying to start from a blank canvas and wonder where on earth to go, we should actually have a go at uh, maybe taking some sort of small framework and copying and pasting it into here. So some, some sort of example that maybe someone else has done before, and um, popping it into here and then basing it around that example. So my suggestion would be that we hop onto Google and do a search for, well, we've got it up there, but if we jump back, if we search for Pygame basic example, if you search for that, hopefully on the really helpful realpython.com site. There's Pygame a primer. If you click on that, they've got an excellent framework here, just a set of code that we're gonna to use to be able to display our particle today and watch it move. The good thing about using this is that we're not really spending ages thinking about how to display our particle um, and how to, you know, as such, make it move visually, that front end side, we're focusing our attention on sort of the behind the scenes, you know, how we update the position of the particle, um, how the velocity affects the position of the particle and so on, how we make it bounce off the walls, that kind of thing. So this is more of a means to an end for us, but we will discuss a little bit around it. But for now, if you uh, copy that and then paste it into your code here and we can save the file.
So the first thing that we should do is either hit F5, which is my go-to shortcut for running, or you can click run and start debugging. So if we hit F5, Python file, with the drop-down that appears, and you should see that you get this Pi game window. There's not much going on at the moment, we've just got a blue circle and a white background, but we're gonna actually turn this into something that's a little bit more interesting and hopefully moving as well. But we know that Pi game at least is working. So just a few things to talk about, just so that you're aware. Uh, just so you can modify the environment. One of the things that we can do is decide how big we want the window to be. I'll leave that completely up to you as to what you want to do with that. But we are going to decide um, or define here a variable that we're going to call space size. And for now, I'm going to make it equal to 500 and I'm going to keep my space here equal to oh, or a square. Uh, if you want to make it a rectangle, that's totally up to you uh, to fill the whole screen, that's fine. But for me, I'm just going to keep it square, keep it simple. And then we can adjust the size of it if we want to make it larger or smaller by just changing this value uh, of the variable at the beginning. And let's just see that in action. First, let's just press F5 to make sure that we still get the same thing. Yep, as we expected. But if we want to make it a bit bigger, we could do that. Say 800 pixels on both sides. There we go. You can see we have made it bigger as well. I'm going to jump back to 500 where we had it originally so that we can focus on some other stuff now. If you want to change the color of the particle, uh, you can do that here. So if you if you look at line 23 in my code here, you've got this pygame.draw.circle. No prizes for guessing what that actually does. And then you can see here if we hover the mouse over circle, that the first thing that we're passing to it is a surface, and that's what we're calling our screen. We've set that up on line eight here. So that's here, that's the first variable that we pass in. And then after that, we define the color. Can you see here? And that's a red, green, blue RGB value that we're gonna put inside this tuple. So the first element being red, but second element being green, third being blue. And let's just cut that from there. I'm gonna paste it up here so that we can decide what the color is. There you go. So at the moment, um, if you're not familiar with how you define um, colors in coding, generally with um, RGB values, they will run between zero and 255. And that's basically because we represent each one of those colors as an eight bit number. So 255 is the maximum number that you can have uh, represented by eight bits. So if we wanted to make it red, well, I should say before we do that, we should make sure now that we've defined the color up here, that we actually copy the variable name color and paste that there so it's much clearer what's actually going on. And then we can define everything at the top that we might want to configure. So as before, let's just run it, make sure that we still see our blue particle, we do. Um, but let's try making it red this time. There you go. So you can see it's as simple as that. If you want a color that's sort of in between, you could, I'm just gonna pick some random numbers, uh, 80, 127, is this gonna be horrid? I don't know, 20. There you can see we get some sort of, ooh, unpleasant green, I think I'll call that. <laughs> so for now, what we're actually gonna do is, I'm gonna make the particle white. I quite like the idea of having a white particle, and we're gonna put it on a black background. So to make it white, we need all three of the colors to be at their full values, so that's 255. But that's gonna be no good for us with a white background. You'll see very quickly our particle has disappeared. So if we go to line 27, you can see here, fill the background with white. Well, let's make it black. So we're gonna set each of the colors to be zero there. And we should be able to run it now. And then we've got white on black. Make it whatever color you want. Go with the most garish thing you can imagine if that's what you like the idea of. I love it. For now, I'm gonna stick with this sort of noir style here. The next thing that we're gonna do is that we're gonna to want to alter the size of the particle. I think it's, for now, for me, it's a little bit too big. If you wanna make it bigger, fine, but I'm gonna make it a bit smaller. And if you look here, you can see that if I move across radius, 
is the fourth item, fourth parameter that's passed to this draw.circle function. So that's this one here that's currently 75 pixels in radius. So if I define radius up here, in fact, I think that's so important actually that we'll put it right at the top. I'm gonna just make it equal to 10, nice and small. And then we can replace this with the variable radius. So if we run this now, we should see that our particle has got a lot smaller than before. Now, the other thing, you can see there are, are a pair of numbers here that are being passed in. So if we have a look at what that means, we can define what the center coordinate is. So actually that's, that's kind of nice because for us, I think it makes the most sense for the center coordinate. Um, oh, what am I on about? I'm talking nonsense. <laughs> Rewind slightly and try again. So what actually this is, is basically the, the center of the circle that you're drawing. I was about to say before that it was the center of, uh, defining the center coordinate of the display. It's not, forget that, forget that. I don't know why I got that in my head. Uh, this is what the center of where the circle's being drawn and then the radius placed around that. So if we want to move our, our particle uh, around the screen, we can. Uh, you can see 250, 250 is slap bang in the middle as we've already seen many times before. There it is. Let's say we wanted to move it closer to a corner. We could go, well, that's maybe a bit too close. 25, 25. That should move up to the top left, hopefully. There you go. Or, you know, let's move it a bit further in the other direction. You can see we've shifted it off a little bit. So you might already be, get, be getting an idea of how we're going to move our particle. Ultimately, what we need to do is to adjust these coordinates to move it around the screen. What we should do, now that we've understood the principle of um, how we can actually move, move, a, move our particle here, is that we should define some relevant parameters for our particle. First, we're going to define an x-coordinate, and I'm going to set that equal to the middle of the screen to start with. I'm also going to define a velocity, and for now, I'm going to make the velocity equal to minus 50. So what that's going to do is it's going to move in the negative direction, so to the left of our screen from the middle. It's going to start in the middle and move to the left of the screen. That's what I want it to do. Even though we're actually plotting this in two dimensions, I don't want us to get kind of caught up in the worries of how to simulate a particle in 2D that has some extra complexity. It's not much, but I think it's enough that we should park that for now. I want us to focus on the critical points that we need to understand, which is how to make it move. So we're just gonna do it in the one dimension. It's gonna just move horizontally across, along the screen, not going anywhere else vertically. So we can fix our vertical coordinate, which is the second one here, to be the, the kind of middle of the screen up for the Y axis, for the vertical axis. And then I'm going to place X here. That's the position of our particle. And that's what we're going to adjust as we go. So now that we've got our uh, X position, our velocity, our radius, there's not too much more right now that we need to do to be able to see if we can get it to move. So let's actually uh, make that happen. One thing I should just quickly explain though first is that um, there's this loop that's running for Pygame and it's running as fast as it can. You can see from line 16 we've got while running, while well, running is set to true here. And the only way right now to escape this infinite while loop is by effectively, as it says here, clicking the window close button. And we've done that many times before already on this video. Um, and that sets running to false, which then stops our, our while loop. So this while loop is just running continuously while our game runs. And we need to do whatever updates we want to do per frame, because remember, each iteration of this while loop, each, each run of this while loop, needs to do some sort of update on the position of the particle, and then display it. Just uh, so that you know, uh, flip the display, that might be a little bit confusing if you're not familiar with the terminology, but what that means is it's going to update the display. 
So it's going to show you the next frame. So you can do all of these updates in the background. And then at the point you call display.flip here, it will actually then update all of those positions, however many particles you have in an instant, and show that new new frame to the to yourself. So what we're going to do after we've done that flip is in preparation for the next loop, we're going to make a change to the position of the particle. And it's going to be really simple. Let's just go x equals x. So the original position right now, or not the original position, the position that it is in right now, but we're going to need to add some uh, velocity to it. So we're going to go add vx, and then we're going to multiply that ah by time. So this is a, a familiar looking equation. So I'm going to call it dt here. We don't have anything available dt right now, and I'll explain how, that, how that's going to work in a minute. But this equation is one of the standard equations of motion uh, to change position. And it basically comes from, if you're familiar with it, uh, speed equals uh, distance over time, or in other words, uh, distance equals speed times time taken. So here, we've got the distance here, the additional distance moved in this frame is the speed times the time taken for that frame. So we need to multiply this speed, or because it has a direction, velocity, by the amount of time taken for the frame. So we have to define some sort of frame rate that we care about here. So we're going to do that up here. Um, after our radius, we will uh, define a frame rate of 60 frames per second. But the rate isn't giving us a time yet because we've got 60 frames per second. So in order to work out how many seconds per frame, you go one over the rate. Yeah, so that's flipping our frames per second to seconds per frame. And it's going to be a lot less than one second per frame because we've got 60 of them every second. And so this is our time step between frames. And you can see here now, thankfully, it's recognized that we have that variable available. And we've got our simple equation. Our new position for x is equal to its existing position plus the amount of distance that it's traveled in this frame, which is equal to the velocity times the time taken for the frame itself. We've defined a velocity here as minus 50, so that looks really positive. We should if all goes to plan, just be able to run this, unless I've made a stupid mistake, in which case we can all learn from it. Here we go. Oh, I have. But was it intentional? I won't let you know. Because what we can actually do is learn something from this. Did you notice? I'll try and, I'll try and do it again. I don't know if you'll actually see this or not. But the particle whizzes off the screen as fast as possible. That's not exactly what we're looking for, because... That's definitely not the velocity that we've set. We've said that we want it to go 50 pixels in the left direction every second. Well, there are 250 pixels to go, so five seconds worth of pixels before it gets to the edge of the screen. So have you got any ideas what I might have done wrong here? Have a little think, just for a brief moment. Why might that particle have gone whizzing off? So, you've got a little time to think. Well, the issue is that this while loop I might have mentioned earlier was running as fast as it possibly can. So it's updating way more than 60 times per second because we've done nothing in this loop to tell it that it needs to slow down and be no faster than 60 frames per second. So this is where we're going to set up what's known as, in this scenario, a clock. So if we define the clock, oh, spell it properly there, as pi game dot time.clock that will now get a clock ready for us to make use of within this while loop and all we have to do which is really neat is to uh, limit the frame rate to the desired number of frames per second and we can do that by just calling clock.tick and then rate that we've defined above here at 60 frames per second. 
And my understanding, unless there's some subtlety that I, I've missed here, is that clock.tick rate will just make sure that there's no way that this loop can run faster than the rate that you've specified. It might run slower if there's too much going on, but it will constrain it to run within this rate of 60 frames per second. So let's hope, now that that's happened, that we'll actually get sensible looking behaviour. It should take about five seconds for our particle to travel to the left to the edge of the screen. Let's hit F5. There we go. I would say that's a pretty good Hello World of Particle Simulation. You have displayed a particle and made it move with a given velocity. We can make it move a bit quicker if we want to, so if we did speed it up uh, to 10 times that speed, you should see it disappear extremely quickly. There it goes. Off it goes on its little journey. I'll keep it at minus 50 for now, because I think there's one more thing that we should probably do uh, within this particular lesson that just makes it that little bit more interesting. Uh, we're going to turn it almost into a game of Pong, with the two borders on the left and the right of the window being our paddles for knocking the particle back and forth. So have a little think to do with this. How might we make the particle bounce off the wall? What are the conditions that we need to actually uh, apply to the particle? What do we need to check for first? And then how do we make it um, bounce? So now that you've had a, a little bit of time to think, maybe pause it if you want to have longer. What we're going to do is that we're going to check if the particle has touched the edge of the screen. And there's a really simple condition for this. So you have to picture the particle is defined by its center. That's the coordinate that we plot. That's the x value that we have defined here. But we don't want it to bounce when that center of the particle hits the edge because it's already intruded on the edge. It's like it's gone into the wall because part of the particle obviously is outside or all of the particle is outside of the center. But to the left of it, for example, um, we've got a radius amount of particle in that direction. So we have to account for that particle radius to make it bounce off the edge. And actually, the way that we do that is that you can go if and the first condition is x minus the radius. So whatever our x value minus the amount of radius is, if that manages to become less than zero in our coordinate space. So in other words, if the left edge of our particle manages to be less than zero, that means we've hit the border on the left hand side. The other condition in our if is checking the right hand border. So what we need to do here is basically flip it round and we're saying if x plus the radius, so that pushes us to the right basically or has us looking to the right side of the particle, if that is greater than the space size that we've defined above here, then we're going to do something. So that's the check. And then what is the actual action that we need to do to make it bounce? It's a surprisingly simple one, and you might have already figured it out. And sorry if it sounds a bit patronizing, but I just want to give folks who haven't really done thought about simulation in this way before, um, or, or been able to get anywhere close to this, to just have a chance to think about it. So what do we do? Well, the only thing that we need to do is literally flip the velocity of the particle. So the way that we do that in one dimension is that we just make a positive, a negative, or a negative, a positive. So in other words, if it's traveling to the left, in other words, the velocity is negative, as we've defined it up here. We then need to make it travel to the right, which is just to make it positive. So it's as simple as this operation. Vx equals minus Vx. So that's just making it the negative of the velocity as it currently is. And that's the only addition that you need to do in order to make the particle bounce. And you can just watch it go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Hopefully this will behave itself. Let's see. Maybe a little bit slower than I should have run it, but we can make it go faster in a minute. There it goes. So you have made a particle bounce. I hope that you've had a chance to do this and watch in awe 
as the particle is doing exactly what you've told it to do. It's not misbehaving at all, and that will just go on forever. But for now, we can close this and let's speed it up a little bit. So I'm going to make this 250. We can just watch it go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There you go. The speed has changed, but you can see it's still bouncing. It's still behaving itself. Everything is good. So if I now stop this, I just want to show you if we run it a little bit slower, we'll go back to the 50 again. Or in fact, yeah, let's go back to 50. And I just want to show you what happens if we don't account for the radius. So just in case you're not fully grasping what's going on here, if I remove the radius from this equation, and I just say that the position is less than zero, which is fine, you know, it's a fine condition, it just doesn't look as neat in the result. So in other words, if, if the position of the particle, the center of it is less than zero, it's outside the frame that we're looking at, outside the display that we're looking at, or it's greater than the space size, in which case it's on the right hand side of the display and it's going out, then make it bounce. Well, this is what happens. You should see in a minute that the edge of the particle doesn't bounce. It actually gets cut off, yep, goes to the center, and bounces back and it should do exactly the same thing on the right hand side. Yep, so that's the effect. That's why we need to account for the radius. So we're going to pop that back in x minus radius less than zero or x plus radius is greater than the space size. And this is it. The hollow world of particle simulation. Well done. We've got through this together. I've made a few mess ups, but we actually managed to get there in the end. And hopefully you can actually see that it's not that difficult to get started with creating a particle simulator. And we can make this so much more uh, interesting, exciting, varied in the coming weeks. But you've done the first thing that you needed to do. You've taken the first step in this process. And I'm super pleased that you've been able to do that with me. Take care, and I'll see you in the next lesson.